Uh, we're on the very last lesson, part two of Why Easter Matters. And last week, uh, people asked me, it says, oh, you mentioned a movie that you thought that we might want to consider watching. Remember I said it was a Hallmark movie and it's called, and I've got it up here, Finding Normal. So if, if you're interested in that, uh, want to write it down, it's called Finding Normal. And, and the way you get it, you just go to YouTube and type it in. And it's one of the very few Hallmark movies that you can get, quote, for free. And I think one of the biggest reasons is um, that it has a gospel message to it. But it's all about this brash, young, arrogant doctor who finds a way to uh, humble herself, so to speak. It's, it's a little hokey, and it is hallmark, but it has a, a great message, okay? All right, let's keep going. Yeah, here's where we are. No one, and I mean no one, expected Jesus to rise from the dead. And, and the question becomes, why is that? <laughs> it's because no one's ever come back from the dead. We, you know, know in through scripture that there have been people that have been taken up who didn't die into heaven, but no one has died and come back. No one. No one. And so even though Jesus talked about this, and even though he raised some people when he was walking on this earth from the dead, Lazarus being one, when Jesus died, people expected him to stay dead. And I thought Bob did this absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful um, going through the events of the crucifixion and after the crucifixion. Because truly, you know, after Jesus died on that cross, there are some events that happened. There were four of them, in fact. Really cool. Total darkness. I mean, it, it, we're not talking a, you know, the cloud covers the sun kind of darkness. Or even the very thickest of clouds. We've all seen days like that, where the thickest of clouds covers the sun, and it seems like it's, it's a sort of a milky color out. We're talking pitch black where you can't see except by torchlight. That's the darkness that we're talking about. That's the darkness it talked about. Then there was an earthquake, which in the Palestine land, the Palestinian type land, that was not uncommon. You know, total darkness. <clears throat> The earthquake, but then the temple curtain being in two, torn from top to bottom. You know, all three of those, you know, there are ways you can explain those away, but the fourth one, the coolest one, people came out of their tombs that had been dead. And it's recorded. And some will say that these were the saints um, uh, biblical figures from years past that came out of the tomb and talked to people and go, well, how do we know about all of this? It's recorded. But even though all this was happening, people still expected Jesus to stay dead. And then, of course, early morning. The women go to the tomb. Why the women, not the men? Men were cowering in fear. Why is that? Well, I think perhaps they had a price on their head also, like Jesus did. So they were off somewhere else. But the women came to the tomb. And what should they have expected? After Jesus' death, the... Um, Mucky mucks uh, of the Sanhedrin went to Pilate and says, you know what this guy said? That he was going to rise after three days. 
we think that his disciples are going to try and steal his body from this tomb. We need you to go and place a guard there. It's recorded. And I can just see Pilate going, whatever. You know, we just need to have this done with, whatever. And he puts a seal over the tomb. This huge rock puts a seal over the tomb. But the biggest thing is he puts a Roman guard there. Not a Sanhedrin guard, a Roman guard. And these guys read the case for Christ, the case for the resurrection. These guys, you know, if something happens to Jesus' body, this is on penalty of death. These guys, it's on penalty of death. And it records after all these other events, the women, you know, that Jesus not being there, they scatter, they go back to the Sanhedrin and say, He's gone. So, what does the Sanhedrin do? Do you know this story? Do you know it from Scripture? And I keep encouraging you to read through the Gospels. Get to know this Jesus fellow. Get to know this Jesus fellow. They go go to the Sanhedrin. They They don't go to Pilate. They go to the Sanhedrin and go, he's gone. And so the Sanhedrin pays them off and concocts a story that the disciples came, which was a story of, on, it was an unbelievable story, but a story anyway, a story where they came and stole Jesus' body from the tomb. Really? A Roman soldiers having this happen? So improbable. But that's the story that went out. And they paid the Roman soldiers to say that. So now we've got the women coming to the tomb. Everybody's gone. There should be Roman soldiers there, people. The tomb should be sealed with Pilate's seal. That big boulder, and I think, Bob, you described it as how big? Four and six feet in diameter. It's a rock. Have any of you ever picked up big rocks? Do you have any idea how much they weigh? We've got one, and I've got, Carolyn and I have one in our front yard. And it's not that big. And I tell you, I know it weighs well in excess of a 1,000 pounds. But this huge rock that had to be rolled, I believe you said, uphill to get it away from the tomb. They didn't expect nothing. And they walk right in. He's gone. They go and tell. And, and it doesn't hit the dead. Jesus is dead. He's supposed to stay dead. And so now they go back and and if you piece all four Gospels together, you get that story. And it's not that one Gospel is right and one Gospel is wrong. They're just telling it from different points of view. Different people telling it from different points of view and sometimes different events. And you piece it all together And the women go back and tell the men, and the men go, your guys are crazy. You guys are absolutely crazy. But they go to the tomb anyway. But when they see the empty tomb, they don't believe. It's recorded. They do not believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Dead people are supposed to stay dead. Even the Son of God is supposed to stay dead because that's what dead people do. They stay dead. And then you get all these other events going on because Luke, precious Luke, records a lot of stuff. And I like Luke because he wasn't a firsthand witness, but he did talk to people who were. So let's do a little bit of this, okay? Dodie, would you keep going? Yeah, just keep going, all right? Yeah, when they found the empty tomb, they were... Skeptical. What's going on? The women, who's stolen his body? The men, what's happened? Let's keep going. While they were talking about this, and I didn't realize, Bob, that the people on that road to Emmaus, they were fleeing. 
You said they were fleeing, trying to get out of there. Interesting, isn't it? While they were talking about this, Jesus himself suddenly stood among them and said to them, can you imagine this? Someone who's supposed to be dead, all of a sudden being right there, notice what he says, peace be to you. It wouldn't have been peace for me. I'd have lost it all, I think. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said, why are you troubled? And why are doubts rising? Notice this in your hearts. Why are doubts rising in your hearts here, people? <laughs> because you're supposed to be dead. They didn't know who he was at this point. And I don't know if Jesus had changed bodies, if half spirit, half physical, I don't know. Doesn't matter to me. But let's keep going. Look at the marks in my hands and my feet and see that it's I myself. Touch me. Touch me. And see, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. So go ahead and touch me. As you see that I have. After saying this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still did not believe it because of their joy and amazement. Notice, they still did not believe. He's appeared to them. He says, I'm physical, touch me, but they still didn't believe. And we go, well, if it had been me, I would have believed. I, I don't think so, at least for me. He asked them, I love this. He asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in front of them. What was it? Wasn't necessarily, I think, because he was hungry. He was trying to show them he's a physical body, and he's there among them. And they had seen him die. They had watched him die and be carried off. And now he's there. Let's keep going. When he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you, everything which has been written about me in the law of Moses, <clears throat> excuse me, and the writings of the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Remember when they asked Jesus and he says, I didn't. I didn't come to do away with this. I came to fulfill the law. Remember? I came to fulfill the law. But here's the key. Then he opened their minds to help them understand the scriptures. Guys, the scriptures have been talking about this for literally hundreds of years. I fulfilled what the prophets were told. I am the Messiah. Let's keep going. So now, I would like to pick it up with the second part of what Andy has to say, okay? Questions at this point? Perhaps you already knew this. He keeps hammering home the point. The reason you are a follower of Christ, the reason for your faith is an event. What separates Christianity from all the other faiths, and you can name them all, Islam, Confuci Confucianism, you just keep going on and on. Most of them a larger than Christianity. Is an event and a person. The resurrection of Christ. Because I'll tell you, 
everything that scripture talks about Jesus had happened. Everything. The Sermon on the Mount, the raising of Lazarus, the, you, just, you just go right through it. But there is no resurrection. If everything that happened in Scripture, it's 100% true, but there's no resurrection. It's a lie. And that's where Peter and the rest of the disciples, after Jesus' crucifixion, were. It's gone. It's done. Everything is over. What do we do now? No one expected Jesus to rise from the dead. Not his closest followers, not his own mother, no one. And when he did, the world was changed. When he gave physical evidence, give me fish to eat. Put your hand in my side. When he gave physical evidence, these disciples, one of the greatest things that tell me the resurrection is too, true are what these disciples did after the resurrection. They went from scared people to a person. They did not fear death. Did not fear death. And for me, nobody marches to their death alive. They saw with their own eyes this precious, wonderful resurrection. And because of this, not only believe in Jesus, we can believe that God loves us. And I really appreciate the way Andy says, and our faith is outside of any event. God does not promise us that every life is going to be perfect. But here's what he does promise us. Heaven's real. And Jesus said, I'm going there and I am waiting for you to come. Let's keep going. The reason we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, let's keep going. The reason that we believe in the resurrection, keep going, is not because of what the Bible tells us. And, and, and again, I keep telling you, I walk a fine line oftentimes, but just hear me out. It's not because of what the Bible tells us. I'm going to clarify it. Let's, let's keep going. It's because of what the eyewitnesses, the disciples, tell us. And you go, well, that's scripture. That's recorded. I get it. I, I do understand. But it's that resurrection the resurrection of Christ that allows us to believe. All right, all right, here we go. And here's why Luke, here's why Luke, here it is. Luke was not all part of this. He wasn't, I, I don't know if he saw it or not, but here's what Luke did. He says, since, this is right at the beginning of Luke, and this is from the Amplified Bible. Since, as is well known, many have undertaken to compile an orderly account of the things which have been fulfilled among us by God, exactly 
as they were handed down to us by those, again, with personal experience, who from the beginning of Christ's ministry were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, that is, of the teaching concerning salvation through faith in Christ. It seemed fitting for me as well. And so I have decided, after having carefully searched out and investigated all the events accurately from the very beginning, to write an orderly account for you. And he's talking to most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. That is the history and doctrine of the faith. In other words, I really wanted to get this right. And I want you to understand the truth. Let's keep going. And here's Paul. And I, and, and, and I didn't know what scripture was going to be for today. It's just, I, I just didn't know it. I chose this earlier in the week because it means so much to me. Some people, I, I, I know some of you sitting and some of you watching, some of you say, I, I, it, Gary, I don't need any more. I just don't need any more. I believe because I believe because I believe because I believe and I've heard that. I need more. I need more. And let me tell you, God has been gracious to give it to me. Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once again of the good news of salvation, which I preached to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and on which you stand by faith. By this faith, you are saved, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. That's why I like the Amplified Bible. It goes into explanations oftentimes. If you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, just superficially and without complete commitment, which I'm here to tell you is very, very easy to do. Which I'm here to tell you, there have been times in my life where that's been me. Let's keep going. Or I passed on to you as of first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to that which the scriptures foretold. And that he was buried and that he was bodily raised on the third day according to that which the scriptures foretold. I came to fulfill the scriptures. Let's keep going. And that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve. And Peter blows me away because it, in my mind as we start talking about if if I were going to build a church I would have never have built it I mean think about it denies betrays that I that form of denial is a form of betrayal impetuous vulgar talked about the Galilean fishermen, and you're going to build a church, a movement continued with Peter at the head. I'm not sure I would have done that, but thank goodness he didn't talk to me. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep in death. <laughs> 500 eyewitnesses of Jesus after the resurrection. 500. Go ahead. Then he was seen by James, then by the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely, prematurely, traumatically born, which Paul can do so well, he appeared to me also. Remember? Paul had gotten permission from the Sanhedrin to go and wipe out Christianity. 
bring them in. And part of it was to bring it in and do away with them. And while he was on there, he met Christ. It's a wonderful story where Christ confronts him. First of all, he has to humble Paul, blinds him. Great story, read it. Okay, don't have time. All right. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? It's a great question. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Let's keep going. And here's where I am. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, useless, amounting to nothing. And faith is also in vain because it's imaginary, unfounded, devoid of value and benefit, not based on truth. We are even discovered to be false witnesses, liars. Hear what Paul is saying. If there's no resurrection, this is all a lie. Everything else is a lie. We are uh, misrepresenting God because we testify concerning him that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Let's keep going. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and powerless, mere delusion, which so many people in the world think we are. When we believe in Christ, when we believe in the resurrection, people in the world will shake their heads. They will shake their heads and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Remember I made the statement, Christianity does not make sense. It just does not. It does not make sense to the world. You are still in your sins and under the control of the penalty of sin. If Christ didn't, you know, if he wasn't resurrected, in fact, all of creation, then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If we who are abiding in Christ have hoped only in this life, and this is all there is, then we of all people most miserable and to be pitied. Then, and only then, if the resurrection is not true, what the world has to say about us is correct. You're following something that's not real. Let's keep going. But here's what we know. And for me, here is what I have just set my life on. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And for me, irrefutable evidence, because I'm a scientific mind, not an emotional being, that evidence tells me, and we can just go down through it, once your mind gets opened, this is real. And if this is real, and there is a place waiting for me. Christ is waiting for me with open arms. And as I've told you before, I want to see each and every one of you in the same place as me. I have a video I'd like you to see. You know, I love the Collingsworth family. 
Well, they got a new song I think is just so appropriate for this morning. Okay? So what's next? And this is where I'd like to go for the next few weeks. What's next? We had the resurrection. What's next? You would think that having seen Jesus, they would be on fire. But that wasn't the case. I'd like to take a look at some of the events that took place for the disciples and others. What's next? What happened to take these core group, this core group, fearing for their lives, to a group that had no fear of death? Because I firmly believe if there's no fear of death, there's no fear of anything. When you lose your fear of death, you lose your fear. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that you rose from the dead. And that one event, we believe in Jesus, we believe in you. We believe in your spirit. Father, thank you. Amen.